Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Orchard Hills Baptist Church on Facebook. I'm Joe Stanley, one of the worship leaders here at Orchard Hills, and I will be preaching this morning about as much as you have want to be forgiven is how much you forgive others. I'm going to show in Scripture how that is. I get an opportunity to fill in for Pastor Stacy here at Orchard Hills. And you guys stay tuned and welcome. Happy New Year. I hope you enjoy and sit back and let's hear uh, Kim Stanley sing a little bit. <laughs> That's funny. Oh, it's good to be with home, folks, mm -hmm. that you love us no matter what. Hey, uh, it's a... It's, um, I hope you've experienced worship in the presence of God today. And you're going to love Joe's message. I already heard a little bit of it. <laughs> but uh, I want to sing the song. We've sung this before, but I kind of want to just a little more of a laid back version. And really so we can listen to the words. And I think it's a great song to sing at the beginning of the year together. Uh, because we want the Lord to be our vision. We want, just like that prayer song said, I pray you'll be our eyes. That we could see we could see how God sees. We could see our neighbor, how God sees our neighbor. We could see the world, even the things that are happening that are so evil and, and, and confusing, we could see with God's eyes. I think that would maybe inspire us to be more merciful, to be, have discernment, to, to bring a word of truth and life to this subject, to, the, to people that we're around. And so that all has to come from God, I know, because if, if we do it ourselves, if I do it myself, it's not going to be pretty. So we rely on the Spirit of God in us to be our vision. He is the Lord of our heart. He's our high King of heaven. He is all the treasure that we have and that we need. I get to share a word from the Bible today in a special way, and this kind of has meant a lot to Kim and I lately in the last four or five years when we do marriage conferences and when, we, when I uh, counsel people before their weddings and that kind of stuff. And I do way too many weddings for not being a pastor, but uh, I coach them, I teach them. You can't say 
counseling anymore, it seems like, to the younger folks. They think something's wrong with them. They don't know it, but there is. No, I'm just kidding, but uh, they, uh, I use the word coaching now. So I coach them through what the Bible says about marriage. And, and one of the biggest talk topics is when we do stuff, marriage conference and stuff, when you can hear a pin drop is, is uh, forgiveness and uh, forgiving one another, as the Bible says to do. And so I'm just going to uh, start with Matthew 6, 9, 15, and you don't have to turn there because you know it pretty well. It is the Lord's Prayer, and let's see if I can't get there. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Church, amen. We hear it all the time. And uh, it's just awesome. And uh, a friend of mine, a friend of ours, had written a book called Forgiving Forward. It's in several languages, and and it's fairly uh, new. But it's, uh, to me, it's just, uh, uh, has helped me so much in my life. And I just wanted to share a little bit of his words from his book and then share uh, some things that, uh, practical ways that we could, uh, protocols for forgiveness as we forgive others for offenses that's been done to us and uh, over the years. And, and I know that there are many in my lives, and I'm, I know I'm not the Lone Ranger. There's many in yours, too. But let me read from his book a little bit. He says, you see, unforgiveness can be one of the most deceptive and deadly traps we fall into. It has been said that bitterness is the poison we drink, hoping someone else dies. That is so right. Bitterness is a heart wound, what, in, what infection is to a flesh wound. If we don't cleanse the wound by forgiving, bitterness can quietly set in without us realizing it. And so everyone at some point, at some point, everyone in this room has been hurt by somebody else. Stung by betrayal or offense, And why does it take so long to recover from the emotional wounds? What is the key that unlocks the door to peace and freedom after we've been wounded? And, of course, the answer is forgiveness. C.S. Lewis said, everyone thinks forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have something to forgive. So what we're going to say this morning is forgiveness. The definition of forgiveness this morning for us is forgiveness is applying the blood of Jesus as payment in full. For every wound I have or will ever suffer. And God expects forgiven people to forgive others so much so that he connects his forgiveness with ours. In the Lord's Prayer, we are asking, dear God, please use the standard I use in dealing with people who wound me as the standard you use to relate to me. So... When we say forgive us our debts as in the same way we forgive our debtors. So forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So let me say that again. Please use the standard I use in dealing with people who wound me as the standard you use to relate to me. So as much as you want to be forgiven is how much you forgive. So Mark eleven twenty five 25 through 26 says, whenever you stand praying, forgive If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father who is in heaven will also forgive your transgressions. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive your transgressions. We we pass over some of that stuff. I I pass over that stuff. I don't want to hear that. I I want to. I don't want to forgive people sometimes who wound me, the offenses. And listen, you. It doesn't mean that if you do not forgive that you don't, you don't make it to heaven. That's not what we're talking about. That's not what this means. People don't go to hell because they haven't been forgiven. They go to hell because they have not repented to receive the benefits of forgiveness. So in 1 John 2, 2 says, He is the satisfaction for our sins, and not for our sins only, but also the sins of the whole world. And so we're going to read again in Matthew 18, 21 through 35. You may know it as the parable of the unforgiving servant. And I'm going to read it. 
out of my Bible, and then I'm going to uh, read a little bit from his book, uh, how he kind of explains it to us. Then Peter came to him and said, this is uh, Matthew 18, 21. Then Peter said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? And he said up to seven times. Uh, Jesus said to him, I, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And we had, when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to pay, his, master's, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and the payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me. Give me some time, and I will pay you all. Then the master of the servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. But the servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servants fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not. But he threw him into the prison, which he's allowed to do in that time, until you pay the debt. So when his fellow servants, the people around him, saw that what he had done, they were very grieved, and came and told their master all that he had done. Then the master had called him back in to him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all the debt because you begged me. Should you not also have compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers. And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due him. And then Jesus says in the red letters, So my heavenly Father also will do to each of you from his heart who does not forgive his brother his trespasses. And his master was angry. And delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all was due to him. Then Jesus says, so my heavenly father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trans trespasses. <laughs> that's, that's, that's different. That's scary when you read it like that. It's just unbelievable. Unforgiveness brings torment. And that's what we want to talk a little bit about that as Jesus does lead that parable. My Heavenly Father will do the same to you if each of you does not forgive your brother from your heart. God withholds his protection when we don't forgive. He unleashes his protection when we do. God gives legal authority for demonic forces to torment us when we don't forgive. Oh, well, a lot of people just say, wait a second, that, that, that's not right. Jesus, this is Jesus' parable. When we, we are tormented, not because we have been wounded, but because we haven't forgiven the wound, the offense. Seventy times seven. We are tormented not because we have been, wo we have been wounded, but because we haven't forgiven the wound. And uh, some examples of torment in my life and maybe yours and some other people that I've talked to is depression, uh, torment of anxiety, fear, nightmares, anger issues, outburst of anger. Anger, control issues, addictions, both drugs, alcohol, and sex, food disorders, and some physical issues is all could be a part, a part of unforgiveness and the torment that Jesus is talking about. Why does God discipline unforgiveness more harshly than any other sin? Forgiveness is at the core of the gospel. It's why he came. Luke 24, 46, 47. And he said to them, thus it is written, that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, so that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. Jesus came to this planet, lived perfectly, stretched out his arms, and said, it is finished. What is finished? The payment for the sin debt of the whole world. The blood of Jesus covers all sins, including the ones committed against you and me, no matter what they were. So remember the definition of forgiveness we talked about. Forgiveness is applying the blood of Jesus as payment in full for every wound I will ever suffer. So I wanted to go back to his book here, if you allow me to do that. It, uh, praying for Stacy's health this morning, Pastor Stacy. And uh, 
he has just been awesome in my life for so many years. When I was a kid, I was in my 20s, and I would uh, listen to the, uh, I was just, I just had come to know the Lord Jesus, and I was listening to the radio. They said, listen to Christian radio. So I'd listen to Charles Stanley on the radio, and then uh, James Dobson, because I had young, young children, and then uh, this other guy came on and did a message, and I, I th- man, I was just connected to this guy for years, and it was Stacy, Pastor Stacy was on the radio, and I didn't even know it, and then eventually uh, his brother uh, invited me to lead worship for his business on Fridays, and I met Stacy for the first time, and he looked at me and said, you're going to be my worship leader one day. And I said, when donkeys fly, I'm not going to be your worship leader. And then sure enough, I, I became his worship leader, and, and, uh, and this church was built uh, upon the rock of Jesus. And we, uh, and he has used, God has used you, Stacy, if you're listening in my life, in an unbelievable way all these years. Let me, let me share. A wealthy ruler decided to settle the accounts with those who owed him money. One servant owed him 10,000 talents. That was an astronomical amount of money. And Jesus is telling this parable. So the servant did not have the ability to repay the debt. So the ruler ordered the man and his family thrown in jail. The servant pleaded, please give me time. I will pay it back. Notice he didn't ask for forgiveness. He asked for time. The ruler's heart was moved with compassion and he forgave the man's debt. Just like that, the ruler personally absorbed the entire amount. And let's work through the currency in Jesus' day. A talent equal to 60 minus. One mina was the equivalent of three months' wages. This means a talent was worth 180 months or 15 years' wages. 10,000 talents would then equal 150,000 years' worth of wages. And he says, please, please give me time. There's no way. He couldn't pay that back. Let's just say the medium annual income in the U.S. is around $50,000. At that figure, 10,000 talents would be roughly equal to $7. billion today. That's billions with a B. <laughs> and you go, that's crazy. And I said, well, this is Jesus saying this. When the ruler forgave the debt, his net worth dropped $7.5 billion, and his servants rose one $7.5 billion. What a gift. We might think the forgiven man would be grateful and be ready to forgive it forward, but But that'd be wrong. Incredibly, the forgiven man went and found someone who owed him money. The debt this time was 100 denarii. The denarius equal one day's pay. So this debt was 100 days wages or roughly 17,000. The same that you'd buy a car, uh, a, a small car in our current economy. Using the same appeal the forgiven man had used, the debtor begged for the opportunity to repay repay the loan. But uh, but this time, there was an actual chance he could feasibly pay it back. That would be a price he could pay back. His debt was comparable to that car loan. So paying it off might take a few years, but it's doable. And uh, the man didn't, unfortunately, the man didn't give him time. uh, Unfortunately, the forgiven man did the opposite. He refused to forgive it forward and threw the debtor into a prison. Unbelievable. As you might expect, the forgiven man's ingratitude and self-centeredness was noticed and denounced by everyone around him. When the news got back to the wealthy ruler, he was justifiably mad. He sent, summoned the man, declared him to be a wicked slave, and turned him over to be tortured. The word tortured here is the same root word found in Luke 16, 23, where the rich man of the rich man and beggar Lazarus fame found himself in torment in Hades. After finishing the parable, Jesus then made that shocking statement in verse 35. So shall my heavenly Father also do to you if, if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. Wow. And he isn't talking to an unbelieving crowd. He's talking to Peter. Now, it's important to note what Jesus is not saying here, like we talked about. He's not saying you'll lose your salvation. He's also not saying that God the Father tortures us. Listen, he's not saying that God the Father tortures us. The Father judges mankind and disciplines his children. The ruler in the parable did not torture the servant, but turned him over to the tormentors who did. The Father simply withholds his protection from us and gives the enemy and his henchmen the legal authority to do the tormenting. Make no mistake, unforgiveness opens the door to a pretty miserable existence. 
Unforgiveness towards the wounds committed against you won't change your eternal destiny, but Jesus makes it very clear that it will affect how you live here on earth. Torment, yes, but still, you're the Father's son, and he loves you. Forgiveness doesn't say what they did is okay. When you forgive someone, it doesn't mean that it was okay, and, uh, but Jesus did pay for that sin. Forgiveness is not a choice. It's a process. We forgive wounds, not people. We forgive people for what they did. We forgive intentional and unintentional wounds. Sometimes we need to forgive unmet expectations. Sometimes we need to forgive ourselves or God. I've been there. I've done both of those. Forgiveness and reconciliation are not the same thing, but it can happen. So, the wound against you, the first offense you can ever, ever remember in your life, or the one that just happened at Christmas <laughs> last week with your family in town, uh, those wounds, those darts, those things, and, those, and, you, and, and it's in you, and it's, and it's causing a little bit of torment, and only you would know if that torment uh, can be released. And when it is, it doesn't mean it was okay, the offense, and it doesn't mean you'll ever be reconciled back to that person. But listen, you release that debt, And torment releases off of you. I've been there, and I've seen it happen so many times. This book talks about so many illustrations. I'll give you one example. I was, uh, uh, like I said, uh, counseling, uh, coaching a young couple, and uh, Cassie and Preston. And I asked uh, Cassie. I knew her parents, and and, uh, I knew they'd been married all and all their children's heirs, and they, they weren't divorced. They lived down the street. Our daughter was friends with the, uh, the future bride. And uh, the young man I've never met before, so they were on the couch, and we were talking, and I asked him about his parents. And I said, uh, will your parents both be at the wedding, and uh, are they still together? And he goes, yeah, they've been together for 37 years, but they haven't lived together for five. I said, are they divorced? He said, no, they're just, they never got divorced. They're just still married. I said, they'll be at the wedding? Yeah, they'll both be at the wedding. And I said, I'd love to talk to them a little bit about something I've learned about forgiveness. And uh, uh, he said, really? I'll give my, my mom your number. Well, she called me before I went to sleep that night and said, I hear you want to meet with my husband and I. And I said, that'd be great. And so uh, they made an appointment for the next day. So the next day, two people I've never met come to my living room. They're sitting on the couch as f- two different cars come down the driveway, and they're sitting as far apart as you possibly can, and I start talking about what we've been talking about today, about what the Bible says about unforgiveness. And I said, there may be some torment in your life, and if nothing else, you can walk through some of these protocols that I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to share with you seven protocols in just a second. It'll be short, then we're done. But you can walk through some of these things that the Bible's telling you about forgiving wounds and offenses. And again, it, it doesn't mean you're forgiving somebody that makes it okay. And it doesn't mean you have to be reconciled back to them. But I want to tell you what God's word said about that. And so, Pastor, you gave us a lot to think about. And we appreciate it. I said, well, I appreciate the opportunity to, to for, talk to you guys and, and be a part of your son's wedding. And uh, he, um, she, she got up, and, and we were all alone. She got up and went to the restroom. And I looked at the man, and I said, what is the first offense you can ever remember in your life? He goes, it's my dad. Uh, several offenses. I said, is he alive? He said, no. I said, you can, you can forgive dead people of their offenses because you've got torment. You can release him of those debts even though he's not here no more. And you don't have to go to people to forgive them. You can just, just forgive them and release them from that debt. Uh, when you don't forgive somebody, it, you're not hurting them. It's hurting you. They don't know it, I guess. And so, he goes, he gave me some stuff to think about. Well, she came out of the restroom, sat back down. And then he got up, went to the restroom. I looked right at her and I said, what happened five years ago? What offense happened in your guys' life to cause that separation? She goes, well, he's an angry man. And uh, finally, five years ago, he threw something. It hit a mirror, shattered it, and a piece of glass cut my arm. I said, nope, that's it. No more. And I said, well, that's what we're talking about. You can release him from that debt. The offense of that particular offense, not every offense he's ever done in anger, but that particular offense, you don't just throw a blanket over everything your husband's ever did to you in 35 years, but that one offense, 
release it, give it back to God, and give God that debt. And uh, she said, Pastor, you gave me a lot to think about. Thank you for sharing today. And so it was awesome. They uh, went up the driveway. We lived down a little gully there. Jack knows he'd been down there. And so he uh, goes up that, they go up, and I'm right behind him, going to go check my mailbox. Two different cars, and he's about to get in his truck, and she's about to get in her car, and she goes, you had lunch yet? No, I'm going to go to lunch. Okay. So they went to lunch together. I said, hey, we got to start. So the wedding, about four or five weeks later, I don't know how many weeks later, I'm dancing with my daughter on a dance floor. She's one of the bridesmaids, and, and I see something strange out the corner of my eye and while I'm dancing. So I dance, start dancing a little bit closer, and, and it's the uh, parents, and they're dancing together, the same people that were on my couch. So I stop, and I tap them on the shoulder. I said, get a room, <laughs> and they both stopped dancing. They hugged me. Ah, I still remember that hug. They just squeezed me, both of them. I said, Pastor, we're working on what you said, what the Bible said. And uh, so that's been a few years. And uh, every once in a while, they live, uh, her parents, of course, live down the street, like I said. And I'll stop when they're there. And I said, how's the parents doing? Said, went on a cruise together. And then I go by. I said, how's your parents? They went camping together. Well, it doesn't always happen. But sometimes when you forgive an offense and that person's still alive, it didn't make it okay what they did. And it doesn't mean you'll ever be reconciled. But something happens in the supernatural, you know, because God is God, and he is who he is. And when you re release somebody from that forgiveness, just the opposite comes. That torment comes off. And, and something happens in the supernatural sometimes, and you might, just might be reconciled back. And that's an awesome thing. One more thing. And um, Forgiving Forward book from Bruce and Tony Hebel. They give us seven protocols, and I wanted to share them with you, and they're really quick. So listen, number one, thank God for forgiving you. So when you're ready to forgive somebody for an offense, my first time I ever did this, I was at Kentucky Fried Chicken with the man who wrote this book, and I started getting angry and about something I said. He goes, you got, you got torment on you. What? You're tormented by unforgiveness. You need to... Here, take this piece of paper and pen and write down everything that you're thinking right now. And so I, I did. I wrote down everything I was thinking. And it was some men in my life that I felt like was uh, taking advantage of me over the years and in and, and certain areas and certain ways. And I won't go into it. And, and uh, so I forgave him. He, he said, I'm going to go to the bathroom. I said, this is awkward. I'm Kentucky, smelling Kentucky fried chicken, writing down everybody I need to forgive. And so I started doing it. And and then he came back and he said, let's do this. And these are the, we did these seven protocols. And I released each and every one of them of their offenses, that one offense. And when I got back home, God is my witness. When I got back to my home from Kentucky Fried Chicken, I got underneath the, the, uh, underneath the welcome out. And there was something sticking out. And it was a, a check from one of the guys I've forgiven. And I, I said, something just happened in the supernatural unbelievable so number one thank god for forgiving you Two, ask god who do i need to forgive and for what number three repent of your sin of unforgiveness so we, we want to make sure god knows that we have uh, we've had unforgiveness in our heart and forgive us for that and then number four forgive each offense from your heart this is individually now not that blanket and it might take some time for some of us in some areas, but sometimes it could be quick. And so forgive each offense from your heart and say, Lord, I choose to forgive Kim from my heart for whatever I have this offense. And then the next thing is, Lord, is there anything else I need to forgive Kim for? And then the next thing is, I declare Kim is no longer in my debt. And that's it. Ask God to bless them. And then look for ways to bless them when possible. Listen, you'll know if you've actually done this on this number five. When you ask God to bless them. So, God, forgive my father for the times he abused me physically. Da, 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 da. 
and, and then and I declare that my dad is no longer in my debt. And then all of a sudden, you, number five, I ask God that you would, b- 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 can't do it. Can't ask God to bless it. I'm not going to ask him. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. Yeah, I'm not going to ask God to bless. You don't know what he has done. You have no idea. But listen, when you get through with number five, ask God to bless them. If you could say, God, would you bless Kim abundantly above anything that she can ever imagine, ask, hope for, and if there's anything I need to do, uh, please put that on my heart. And then number six, commit to not remember. That's a hard one. Not remember the offense. And when the memory does come back up, say specifically, I remember forgiving that. And then praise God for the freedom, forgiveness brought to you, that torment that was released from you. And just praise God. And then bless the person you forgave once again. Can't, pr- can't bl- uh, ask God to bless dead people, but uh, you, you can ask God to uh, or, or release that person from the dead. And then pray for, and go ahead and pray for reconciliation. Pray that it, you would get back together with the person who offended you if, if it caused separation. And the last thing, make pre-forgiveness a lifestyle. It's a shield. The shield of, I'm, I'm not going to go there. Every time I'm around that guy, gee, many Christmas, I just get offenses, offenses, offenses. And so it's like pre-forgiveness. I forgive. I'm releasing you from that debt. Bless you. You're doing that in your heart. You know, almost as they're speaking, once you get this thing down, it's amazing. Make pre-forgiveness a lifestyle. So Kim and I, uh, so in the morning, I wake up, tap Kim on the shoulder and say, Forgive me for the offenses that I'm <laughs> going to, no, no, here's, here's, I tap her on the shoulder and say, Kim, I, for, I forgive you for any offense you're going <laughs> to give to me today. And then I say, and Lord, Kim, would you forgive, I know for sure I'm going to offend you several times. Please forgive me for my daily offenses. I know it. It's kind of a funny thing, but it, it it's kind of gives you an example that you do have a pre-forgiveness and your spouse is, uh, is, is, is in that. And it doesn't make it right doesn't make it okay, but it will release torment, the same torment that Jesus talks about, the, the tormentors, the torture. And uh, so we've seen several people released and free, even in their bodies, hunched over. We stand up, released. Some people throw up. Crazy, and but real. So if you'd stand with me, I would like to go over these seven. So this all stand up. And if you're watching by Facebook, do this in your heart. There may be one person, one offense that is kind of huge in your heart. It might be something a long time ago. Or it might just be last week at Christmas when your family was in town and the disagreements from maybe it was political or, 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 or about COVID. I don't know. But we need don't experience any more torment. Because the Bible says you can be set free. He died for you on the cross. His blood cleanses us. And we can release those debts and forgive people. As much as you want to be forgiven is how much you'll forgive. The Bible was clear on that in several passages. As much as you want to be forgiven is how much you'll forgive. And you'll be released from torment. So let's, let's pray these seven protocols together. And, and if you have somebody in mind, just say that in your heart. <clears throat> thank you God for forgiving you ask God who do I need to forgive and for what repent of your sin of unforgiveness and now forgive the offense that's in your mind right now from your heart and say this Lord, I choose to forgive, blank, from my heart for, and name the one offense. Lord, is there anything else I need to forgive, blank, for? I declare, blank, is no longer in my debt. Lord, I ask you to bless them and help me find ways to even bless them myself when possible. And now, Lord, I commit not to remember the offense anymore. 
And Lord, when the memory comes, let I remember that I, re that I forgave that offense specifically. And Lord, I pray for freedom that forgiveness is bringing to me right now. I praise you for the freedom uh, that forgiveness is bringing to me right now. And Lord, again, bless the person that I forgave. And Lord, if it's something that we need to be brought back together, I do pray for supernatural reconciliation in your perfect timing. And Lord, help me to ha make pre-forgiveness a part of my lifestyle to forgive people quickly so that I don't experience torment. And Lord, thank you that you forgive us our debts. In your word, you said, as we forgive our debtors. I pray that in Jesus' name, amen. Let's, get, let's continue to pray, and we'll just uh, come on up, and we'll, we'll, we'll just say uh, one more prayer, and then we'll be out of here. And Father God, we just thank you for your word this morning. I do pray for healing on Stacy. Pastor Stacy, that, that, that you would just give him healing grace in an unbelievable way. And Lord, from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet, would you heal him completely? We speak to his body right now in the name and the power of the blood of Jesus Christ that covers us and cleanses us and washes us and heals us from every wound. And Lord Jesus, we pray that in our own lives, Lord. I pray that if there's anyone listening or on Facebook that doesn't know you as Savior and Lord and don't know what we're talking about, the first thing is God loves you. God sent his son to die for your sins, and he shed his blood on the cross. And that blood covers your sin today if you believe. And you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. And he becomes your Lord and Savior. Not your co-pilot, but the pilot. And you just turn your life over to him. He'll make your path straight. And you'll spend eternity with him. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That whosoever believes in him will not die, but have everlasting life. And we are all whosoever's. No matter what you've done. No matter how bad it was. There may be consequences for the sins that you have committed. But God himself has sent Jesus Christ to die for that sin. And you are cleansed and you are washed. And God wants to use you. And he wants to guide you and help you. And he'll make your way straight again. He is the way maker. Even when you don't feel it, he's working. Amen. And we pray this in Jesus' name this morning. Amen, church. Thank you for hearing the message today. If you want to know more about Orchard Hills Church, I pray you'll go to Orchard Hills Church at orchardhillschurch.com. If there's any way we can minister to you on a greater level, please contact us. If you want more information about this message, other messages, or how we can minister to you, please contact us. May God bless you, and you have a great day.